Good morning. Amen. Let's go on with our first Corinthians chapter seven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We ask for your favor. We want you to move today. Touch us, Lord, that we may touch others in your name. It will be source of blessing, oh God, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's uh, continue with our first Corinthians chapter seven. I'm going to start reading from 34 and 35 and on. Hopefully we could finish today, this chapter. There is difference also between wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord that she may be the holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and yet ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction, without distraction. And that was the key verse that I was focusing on. That that's it. That's what he's trying to get at. Undivided attention. Attend upon the Lord. This is part three. How do you become like Mary? Focus on Jesus and Jesus only. So, so much so that all this stuff that you go through in life is just, yeah, you go through it, but well, compared to what I'm focused on, it's just, it could happen, it could, doesn't have to happen like that. So that's what he's trying to say. Focus. Amplified Bible says, now I say to you for your own benefit, not to restrict you, but to promote what is appropriate and secure, undistracted devotion to the Lord undistracted devotion. The word devotion actually literally means when it is uh, uh, used in Greek, sitting well toward. That is to say, assiduous. Assiduous, assiduous is a old English. Assiduous means you sit well and look to it. Just like I mean, it talks about this position of Mary. What did Mary do? Sit still right in front of Jesus, looking at him, admiring him, taking every words that he's saying, assiduous, sitting well toward. So John Wesley picks it up. Who are able that ye may resolutely and perseveringly wait upon the Lord. The word translate wait signifies sitting close by a person, you know, good posture to hear. So Mary said at the feet of Jesus, Luke 10, 39. So he's picking up Luke 10, 39. He said, that's it. Have this kind of attitude. You know, I just uh, read uh, somewhere in the leadership, uh, I think it was Pastor Han Hong's book. And when he actually did a leadership training and found out, and he met all these world-renowned uh, uh, CEOs, and he got to meet with Samsung CEO and talk and and then he said the one thing that the common denominator between these great leaders is that they just have this great attitude <laughs> toward you, toward the subject, and then they're so focused. You know, I, I meet a lot of these guys, and sometimes these people, they just have their cell phone on, and, and they're constantly checking their phone, and I'm thinking, oh, I guess meeting me is, has no value to these people. And I was actually called on that to Jenny. And I was at a meeting and she you know that honey that you're looking at your watch and looking at all this. I'm like, really? I did that? I, I need to be careful. When I meet someone that I want to meet as if I'm looking at the face of God. To love somebody is to see the face of God, right? Undivided attention. And that attitude will get us far. Right? And, and we don't do that to get us far in life, just like it's not a capitalistic thing. But I mean, to value somebody, to love somebody, yeah? and give your whole attention to somebody. Why would you have your, you know, Facebook message pop and cut talk pop and, you know, ding, 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 and they're constantly, and you're, here you are talking to him. Would you do that when you meet a president of the United States? No, right? Don't, you cannot even bring the phone inside. But give that kind of honor to somebody that you meet today. So have that undivided attention. But now this but separates the whole paragraph now. So verse 36, but, but what, right? 
that but separates, and he's now going to go toward verse 40. The verse 40, he says, hey, I think also I have the spirit of God. That's what he's trying to say. What is he saying? Why is he saying that? Why did he put a condition there? But because the first letter he wrote, so, so crony, so, so called spirit filled, another apostle type, with the super apostle that, that Paul hates, you know, claims to be super apostle. Right? And these are the people who say, ah, oh, don't listen to Paul. Right? Well, it's just the old guy, you know, old guy can't even get married probably because he's, you know, and he's, why would he, you know, this free life is so good, this hyper grace is so good, we could have sex all we want and we could do whatever we want because God has forgiven everything on the cross. We don't even have to repent, right? Hyper grace. Yeah. Wow. This uh, English woman that I was uh, talking with, she's a missionary here, and she said, I can't believe this hyper-grace people from America that I meet. It's just ridiculous. And some Indonesian missionaries said, oh, what's wrong with America? Why do you have these hyper-grace guys come around? And, you know, and, 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 and these are wives that, these are the women who start some dating some pastors. And they, oh, it's, I mean, they casually talk about these pastors who, who are also single and divorced, or, and they casually talk about sex they had with other women. And, and they're like, why would you even, I mean, you're a pastor, why would you be so casual about that? Well, because God has forgiven us. I know, you may think like, are you kidding me? I'm like, yeah, I'm not kidding. But, but if any man think that he behaved himself uncomely, not acting honor honorably, acting inappropriately toward his version, if he passed the flower of her age and need to so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not. Let them marry. Okay, now we need help from NIV. What is he talking about? If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward version he's engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. So he's saying that, hey, I have the spirit of God too. And the spirit of God didn't tell me as a command from Jesus. No, I'm just, it's my opinion. Man, you're engaged, but if you could want to live a single life, go ahead. The end is coming. It's upon us. So it will be better. I mean, otherwise, you know, wives, you worry about your husband. What am I going to cook for him? And husband, oh, what kind of flower do I need to bring? How do I please my wife? I forget that. Well, why don't you just spend the rest of your life because Jesus is upon us. Time is shortened. Just, for, just work on the kingdom of God together. It will be better. But, hey, and if you cannot contain yourself and you're going to have sex anyways, well, then get married, right? Acting inappropriately, right? It's to be unbecoming. It's not talking about action, but talking about character, right? By You become that character by committing the sin over and over and over again. You become unruly, uncomely, acting unhonorably. You become unhonorable character. So Matthew 1, 8, Jesus says the same thing. This is how the birth of Jesus came. His mother Mary was pledged in marriage to Joseph, but before they got come together, before they had sex, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit God. Whoa, wait a minute, scandalous. So what is apostolic advice? Well, if you cannot do that, then get married. Um, Actually, Paul was way, way, way ahead of his time. He's actually protecting the right of woman, protecting the right of this gal. This is human rights, I mean, gender rights of, of she being a woman. And they, they didn't have uh, one to choose from. I mean, it, it, it's uh, arranged marriage is not just Asian thing. Europe, way be France, especially, they just, they didn't even get to see each other. It's betrothed by what? Parents, right? Sometimes by grandparents, by political reason or family ties, whatever. So here, Ellicott writes, if the case arises that a parent thinks that 
he would be acting unfairly toward his unmarried daughter, that is to say, exposing her to temptation. By withholding his permission for her marriage, he ought to do as he feels inclined. That is to say, let the lover and his daughter marry. So he's protecting the right of her daughter. Right? And, and because at the time, the father had right to have her not marry. And maybe there was a case in Corinth, some of these hyper, you know, uh, uh, anti-sex, you know, the, the, if you're sexually corrupted, the, the reverse side is anti-sex so much that, okay, Paul says that it's better that you don't marry. So don't get married. And that's it. That's rule. And that's it. Father decides well, that she has to be single. No right. She had no right 2,000 years ago. But guess what? Paul's saying, no, you have no right. Because she loves him and he loves him. And how about don't let them expose to sexual temptation. Let them marry. Um, so in a way that protects her. I'm going to read 37, 38, 39 altogether. But I'm going to read in Berean. New American and amplified. It'll be interesting. But then, but the man who was firmly established in his heart and under no constraint would control over his will, resolve in his heart not to marry the virgin. He will do well. So then both the one who gives his own virginity in marriage does well, and the one who does not give her in marriage will do better. A wife is bound to her husband by law as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's free to marry whomever she wishes, only provided that he too is in the Lord. Wow, pretty clear, huh? So, it's, it's not wrong to marry, but it's better if you could control your sexual temptation to just stay pure. Why not? Jesus is coming soon, right? But finally, verse 40 but he is happier, blessed, supremely blessed if she remains in this way, according to my mind. But I think also that the spirit of God is in me. That's his final bang on chapter seven. Hey guys, I'm a super apostle too. I have the Holy Spirit God living in me, right? I too have some authority. And then in, and, and in this very book, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 37, this is what Paul wraps it up. So he's following up on what he said in 740 by saying that, hey, I have the spirit of God too. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I have written unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Wow, that's pretty strong statement saying that, hey, if you've got the same Holy Spirit God working in you, then you should recognize that what I've written is from the Lord. Lord. If you don't, you're, you're, you're blown. You know, you don't have the Holy Spirit God in you. You're a false prophet. Is he that certain about what he wrote? That he makes it very clear. What I'm saying, some of the stuff that I told you, just advice. That's my personal view. That's my opinion, but not this one. This one, Holy Spirit said. That settles it. Don't argue. There's, there's a unilateral decision. God decided. And that settles it. Wow. Can you say that about your life? That was my question. I asked at the end of this commentary, do you have the spirit of God living in you? How does that manifest in your life? How can you prove? Like Paul says, it's God. See, that's where I want to get there. That's why I fasted 21 days. And that's why the media fast. Because I would like to be certain that what I sense and what I got from the Lord is from the Lord. That is not some effect of triple pizza pieces I ate night before. It's not out of some stupid program that I was watching on Netflix that is influencing me. Right? Cleanse it. Cleanse it. 21 days of cleansing. Purify. Purify. And Lord starts speaking. And then I said, yes, Lord, here's your servant to listen and obey. I pray that you too will join in an understanding today that you could claim, hey, I too have the Holy Spirit God living in me. 
Yes, Lord. Amen. Lord bless you. I'll see you tomorrow.